concluding message of our study in the book of Daniel. I hope you've enjoyed this study as much as I have. Because of travel plans, I'm recording this message in advance, but I want you to know that on the day you study Daniel chapter 12, my heart is going to be with you because it's a great opportunity for all of us to thank God for this astounding book that originated in the life of a wonderful man by the name of Daniel some 600 years before the life of Jesus Christ. You know, in my time at Oak Hills Church, I've preached well over 50 series to our congregation. But I think I can say this has been the most challenging series to date. This book is stimulating, it's perplexing, it's exciting, and I've done my best to present to you my best take on this wonderful study. What's important in this study is that we understand the big message and that is that there is a God in heaven and that he is bringing all of history toward a powerful and decisive victory. Now no one understands all the details of what's going to happen between now and the end of history. I don't. No Bible student does. And I've simply done my best to unpack to you what seems to me to be a fair interpretation of this wonderful book. And if your study takes you in a little different direction, that's okay. What's important is that we agree that there is a God in heaven and he's going to bring a great victory to this earth. Amen. And that's what matters the most. Well, we're going to dig into chapter 12 and wrap this up, put a ribbon on the book. But before we do, can I say a prayer and then we'll get to work. Heavenly Father, we thank you now. We thank you for this wonderful book. We thank you for what you've taught us in this study. Lord, it leaves us hungry, wanting to know more. We pray you'd forgive our teacher. His sins are many. And, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would please reveal to him and to us just a deeper understanding of what your future is, what, what, what you hold for us in the future. And we pray that we could be like Daniel, people who are prepared, people who understand your word, who seek your truth. We pray this, for these are difficult, severe days in which we live. And so we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And all the church said, well, my dad made a big deal out of family vacations. He enjoyed preparing for the vacations as much as the vacation itself. Our vacations always consisted of a long road trip and then some time in a campground in the mountains. Usually, the road trip was from West Texas to Colorado. But there were a couple of times we ventured out as far as Yellowstone Park or, or Yosemite, one time to the Grand Canyon. <clears throat> he loved vacations. And he loved preparing for them. Uh, in, in, in spring, uh, when the spring weather began to change, he would start talking about our summer vacation. And he began making decisions as to where we were going to go, and he didn't always tell us. He would surprise us. He would talk about it until right up on the evening before the vacation, and then he would tell us. Now, <clears throat> this was back in the days before there was GPS and before there were cell phones, of course. And so he would plan our trips the old-fashioned way with an honest-to-goodness foldable map. <laughs> and he would spend hours over that map in the days leading up to the vacation, and he would use a highlighter, and he would highlight our route on the map. He would circle the restaurant or places where we were going to stop at restaurants. He would circle the names of campgrounds where we were going to spend the night. And then, of course, he would have in high highlights the name of the campground where we were going to spend uh, most of our vacation. And then, in an act of great drama, in an act that I cherished, he would, on the eve before the trip, sit me, my brother, and his wife, our mother, at the table and unfold the map. <laughs> And he would let us see where we were going. Oh, can you imagine how excited we were? My brother and I, we were just single digit age, you know, nine or ten years of age. Oh, how we would sit on the edge of the chair with, with both elbows on the table and our, our chin cupped in our hands and just listening to dad as he would describe where we were headed. 
And since we didn't know anything about travel, uh, since we didn't know what to expect, uh, uh, since we were newcomers to the road, he not only told us where we were going, he told us what to ex- expect. He would say, now, sons, <clears throat> when we get into New Mexico, now that, that desert wind can blow. You got to prepare yourself. And he'd say, sons, now, when, when we get close to the mountains, you're going you're, you're to feel your ears begin to pop. He would say, boys, now, you'll know we're getting close to the end when you see those wooden signs that say National Park. They all have green trees painted on them, those those pine trees, and he would describe them to us. Now, why would he do that? I mean, aside from being a fun-loving guy, why would he go to the effort of showing us the map. And then why would, he, why would he go to the effort of preparing us ahead of time so we would know what to expect? Why was it important to our Father for him to tell us what signs to look for? And as long as we're asking the question, Why has God done the same? Over and over, as we've studied through the book of Daniel, I have suggested to you that this book is a roadmap of sorts, or it's a timeline. It's an itinerary of the human journey, especially the book of Daniel. God has told us what to expect. He has told us What's going to happen? And he has prepared us so we will know how to behave when we begin to see the signs. Of course, the book of Daniel is far from the only book in the Bible to do this. It may surprise you to know that 30% of your Bible is comprised of prophecy. 30%. Did you know that entire volumes such as Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Revelation are prophetic? So to to dismiss prophecy is to dismiss one-third of your scriptures. Yet many people do. Many people do. They dismiss prophecy. They say, just... Just give me the Lord's Prayer and just give me the 23rd Psalm. Just just give me the stories. I I, I can't handle that prophecy. They they may do so for a couple of reasons. Uh, First of all, prophecy, it can be complicated. It can. And it can be controversial. And teachers of prophecy, well, have a tendency to be opinionated. I understand the hesitancy, but I would encourage you, dear friend, I would encourage you, don't be listed among those who miss out on the blessing of studying prophecy. Yes, blessing. God promises a blessing for those who study the words of the prophetic teachers. In fact, he closes the book of Daniel with this promise. Those who are wise will understand. Those who study this prophecy, those who gather this wisdom, they will come to a sense of understanding. So this is a promise of God. That as you study prophecy, you will understand. You will come to new levels of understanding. You will have those aha moments in which you say, oh, now I see how this lines up. Oh, now I see what this passage means. You see... God wants to give you what my father gave my brother in me, and that is a glimpse into the future. He wants to show us the journey, and he promises a special blessing, a special blessing for those who read and heed the words of prophecy. Maybe you've read these words found early in the book of Revelation, the most famous of the prophetic books. God blesses the one who reads the words of prophecy to the church. I guess that's me. (laughs) And he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says. I guess that's you. 
for the time is near. There's a story about an airplane that was lost over the ocean in the middle of a hurricane. The captain decided that it was time to assure the passengers that he was still in the cockpit. So he announced over the intercom, well, I have good news and I have bad news. The bad news is I have no idea where we are or where we are headed. The good news is we're making great time. That describes the lives of many people today. We are busy but lost, in a hurry but with no destination. You know, we're running faster than ever, but we have no idea where we are going. But to all who will listen, God will share the blessing of the destination. He'll show you the map, and in addition, he'll show you the signs to look for along the way. He opens the map and tells us where we are headed. Chapter 12 begins with a reminder of where this history is headed. He calls this the tribulation. Verse 1 of chapter 12. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as not has happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people... Everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and will lead many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase. This passage, as well as the rest of the book of Daniel, anticipates a major event in the future called the tribulation. We've come to see that's a a period of of seven years. And I I personally take that seven-year time frame as literal. It's a a seven-year period in which there will be times of intense struggle for who the book of Daniel calls your people, Daniel, that is the Hebrews. Others will be involved, but certainly those who are of Jewish heritage in the city of Jerusalem will face a time of intense struggle. This is just one of several prophecies or several promises, uh, moments that are going to happen in the future that we have looked at. I'd like for us to take just a minute and back up and review some others, just so we can look at the timeline and look at the map one more time. Scripture tells us that there will be a sudden, unexpected resurrection of the saints. This is often called the rapture, and it's going to happen without warning. But at that moment, every believer who has placed his or her trust in Christ will be resurrected in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. They will be given a new body. They will be welcomed as the bride of Christ to a wedding feast in heaven. This will be a glorious day for all who have trusted in Christ. But this will trigger a difficult day for all those left behind. You see, in this moment, in a millisecond, the church and her restraining influence, the Holy Spirit, will be gone. He, the Holy Spirit, is what holds is who holds evil at bay right now. And for a time, the Holy Spirit will step away. Now imagine the ensuing chaos when the church and the Holy Spirit are removed from society. When all those who seek to do good are suddenly gone. When all those who teach truth are suddenly missing. It seems to me that their sudden departure will cause a moral, financial, and political tailspin. And this, this, this world, as we know it, will, will turn into a chaotic mess. And this chaos will set the stage for an evil despot, a tool of Satan, the Antichrist. He's a primary character in the book of Daniel. Now, according to the prophecy of Daniel 9, this Antichrist is going to step forward and he's going to broker a peace treaty in the Middle East that will seem to settle everything down. It's going to encompass the world. The promise is this, that leader, speaking of the Antichrist, 
will make a firm agreement with many people for seven years. He will stop the offerings and sacrifices after three and one half years. A destroyer will do terrible things until the ordered end comes to destroy the city. So the Antichrist will step forward. He will broker a peace treaty. Apparently this peace treaty involves the reconstruction of the temple. Yet after three and a half years, he's going to stop the offerings And he will engage in what Jesus Christ himself calls the abomination of desolation. He will position himself as God and demand to be worshipped. And this will trigger a season of suffering. But after this season of suffering, a resurrection will occur, as we just read in Daniel chapter 12. A sum to everlasting life and some who rejected God to shame and torment. Even most important, at the end of these seven years... Christ himself will come. Can we reread the promise from Daniel chapter 7? This king, speaking of the Antichrist, will speak against the Most High God and he will hurt and kill God's holy people. He will try to change times and laws that have already been set. That is to say, he will try to create a religion that's set up around himself. The holy people that belong to God will be in that king's power for three and one half years. But then the court will decide what should happen. That's the court of God. The power of the king will be taken away and his kingdom will be completely destroyed. Then the holy people who belong to the Most High God will have the power to rule. And they will rule over all the kingdoms under heaven with power and greatness. And their power to rule will last forever. (laughs) That's the beautiful promise of the book of Daniel. The church will be raptured. The tribulation will be severe, but it won't last forever. Christ will return and he will establish his kingdom on this earth with his saints and he will rule forever. Now you may have more questions. Daniel did, but before Daniel could ask for an explanation, did you notice he was told to seal up the book of prophecy? That is to say, no further revelation is going to be coming. Daniel had been given all that he would be given the review was complete. Even so, a couple of questions remained. And as we read further in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel saw what appeared to be an angel and he heard the angel ask, now how long before these amazing things come true? Well, what do you know? We used to ask that question on vacation. How long, dad? How long before we get there? (laughs) I guess that was an angelic question. The answer came from Jesus himself. Reading again in Daniel 12, the man dressed in linen who stood over the water raised his hands toward heaven and I heard him swear by the name of God who lives forever. It will be for three and one half years. The power of the holy people will finally be broken and then all these things will come true. I heard the answer, Daniel said, but I really did not understand. So I asked, Master, what will happen after all these things come true? He answered, go your way, Daniel. The message is closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many people will be made clean, pure, and spotless. But the wicked will continue to be wicked. Those wicked people will not understand these things, but the wise will understand them. (laughs) The angel needed an explanation. Daniel needed an explanation. How long, asked asked the angel. What shall be the end of all these things, asked Daniel. Give us more details, in other words. And Jesus came. And gave them more details. Now you and I would love more details too. We don't have all of our questions answered. But as we have sought God. He has given us more details. I believe that God has done for us. What he did for Daniel. God has given us more details. In fact the details that God has given to us. Are sufficient enough to cause me to think. We really may be nearing the end. I do not say that lightly. And I realized in every generation, there have been those who have said, now this is the last generation. And yet there are certain things about our generation that command our attention, that cause us to wonder, are we truly toward the end? Are we truly nearing the final rapture? I believe that Christ could come at any moment. I believe this Not just because of what I read in the scriptures, but also because of what I read in the newspaper. Now, again, to be clear, no one knows the exact time of our Lord's return. Jesus said, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. The exact time is hidden from the followers. We do not know the hours. 
but we have been told to look for the signs. And we are told to respond to the signs. Now, you know how to respond to signs. You see signs on the highway whenever you're driving or riding in a car. For example, when you see this sign, what does it tell you? Well, because of that sign, you're going to anticipate a wet road. You don't know the exact location or the amount of the water, but, but you anticipate water. What about this sign? Now, do you know the amount of construction or the purpose? No, but you know you need to be alert. What about this sign? Well, who put that in there? That must be from God. I mean, we sure don't want to <clears throat> ignore the signs, do we? <laughs> no, Jesus has not given us the hour of his return. But church, we have signs. We have signs. As we're traveling through life, as we're traveling toward our final destination, just like my father told my brother and me what signs to look for, so Jesus Christ has said, now here's some signs. He criticized the religious leaders of his day for not looking for signs. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you will say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Now, would Jesus need to give us the same rebuke? We know how to read the weather forecast, but we're not paying attention to the signs of the times. Consider what Jesus says about reading signs. Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming, I am the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. In other words, we shouldn't be too quickly misled. Men have been declaring the end since the very beginning. There are endless skirmishes and conflicts and rumors of wars, and these mean nothing. They are not signs. But the true signs are these. Look what he says next. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of birth pains. Now, note that phrase, birth pains. We men are really not qualified to explain what a birth pain is, but I have it on good authority that birth pains are painful, and they come with increasing frequency as the time of delivery draws near. Jesus is saying that there are certain signs that are going to be painful. They're going to be disruptive. And they're going to come with increasing frequency as the end draws near. With that in mind, consider a couple of signs of the end. He says, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now, now this is a colloquial expression used by Hebrew rabbis in ancient literature found often that describes a unique type of war. It's, a, it's an expression that describes a widespread conflict. Our phrase for this conflict would be world war. World war. So Jesus is saying you will see world wars. Now have we? Of course we have. Twice in the last century we have seen conflicts that are so universal that they earned the phrase World War. In fact, the first one was called the War to End All Wars, but then came the second one, World War II. More people died from war in the 20th century than in all the other centuries leading up to the 20th century combined, combined, increasing frequency, increasing pain. What about natural disasters? Specifically, Jesus says, famines and earthquakes. Of course, the world has always seen both. But did you know we're seeing them with increasing frequency? Examples, for example, earthquakes. According to one study, from 1939 to 1976, there were 71 earthquakes. Yet from 1977 to 2014, there were 164. That's an increase of 131%.
Does it seem to you that the birth pains are increasing in frequency? These are signs on the road. And there are more signs. I have time for just a couple, but consider this one. The most remarkable sign, I think, of our generation is the regathering of the Jewish people in Israel. Did you know that the Bible speaks of a day in which the Jewish people will reoccupy their homeland? Way back in the book of Jeremiah. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their forefathers to possess. Now, almost all the key prophecies in the book of Daniel depend upon a repopulated geographical Israel. For example, the book of Daniel prophesies a covenant between the Antichrist and Israel. This can only happen if the nation of Israel exists. The book of Daniel prophesies a rebuilding of the temple. Again, Israel must exist. It must occupy the land in order for this to happen. Daniel forecasted an utter sacrilege of the temple. Well, no Israel, no temple. The war of Armageddon only makes sense if Israel is occupying the land where the valley is found. Now, the idea of a repopulated Israel was unthinkable just a few decades ago. You know the history. The Jewish people were dispersed to over 70 countries for more than 20 centuries. Yet in our day, we are seeing them return. Did you know that today, for the first time since A.D. 135, there are more Jews living in Israel than any place on earth? There is a regathering of the Jews to Israel. Could this be a sign? It's unique to our generation, that's for sure. This super sign is in itself, is enough to get our attention. Maybe we have time for one more. How about globalism? Globalism. You know, the book of Revelation prophesies a day in in the tribulation in which an evil ruler will commandeer the world economy and that no one will buy or sell without his permission. Well, a hundred years ago, this was impossible. How could anybody commandeer the world economy a hundred years ago? But today... Thanks to the proliferation of electronic banking and and credit and debit cards, it's possible. The world is a smaller place. Globalization has shrunk the globe. And Scripture repeatedly promises a plunge into immorality in the end times. I know the world has always been immoral. Yet because of globalism, because of the Internet, because of accessibility that we have between one culture and another, between another country and this one. Pornography is peddled on a global scale like never before. Porn peddlers in Russia can poison the thoughts of a teenager in Kansas at any point during the day. Folks, that wasn't true when I was a kid. That wasn't true when I was growing up. It wasn't true 30 years ago, but it's true today. Might it worsen? Yeah, probably. But can we say that we have plunged into a dark cesspool of immorality? Absolutely, we can say that. The world is smaller. And because the world is smaller, the possibility of global disasters are more likely. The Antichrist, during the time of tribulation, will unleash uh, atrocities upon the globe. What's he going to use? Bacteria, nuclear power, financial sabotage, a combination of them all? We live in a day in which he could, thanks to... To globalism. Now, we could add more signs to this list. The mysterious blood moons, the attempts at peace in the Middle East, the increased apostasy of the church, but all of these add up to make us wonder if we couldn't be getting close to the end. Now, again, no one knows. No one knows. And anyone who says they know, well, they're wrong. But we should pay attention to the signs. The Father has told us what to expect. Now, if you're in Christ, you have nothing to fear. And I suggest these signs not to increase a level of anxiety at all, just the opposite, but to affirm you. You see, Christ said these things would happen. So we know he's in control. You know what is coming. But if you've never given your heart to Christ... I share these signs to alert you. You need to be ready. 
And you need to make sure that you have placed your trust in the hands of the one who controls society. By the way, we never did answer that question. Why did my father tell my brother and me about the map? Why did he show us where we were going? Well, I think there's a simple answer to that question. I never did ask my dad, but as a dad myself, I, I think there's an answer. I think he wanted us to know that he knew where we were headed and what would happen. <laughs> you see, it turned out he was right. When we got to New Mexico, the winds did blow. When we reached the mountains, our ears did pop. And you know, when we got close to the campground, we began seeing those wooden signs that said National Forest, and they all had that little green ever tree, evergreen tree <laughs> imprinted on them. By the time we reached our destination, I was proud of my dad. I trusted him because he had promised and he had delivered. My friend, our God deserves our worship. He has promised and he has delivered. What he said he would do, he has done. So what he says he will do, he will do. Amen. So Heavenly Father, thank you now for this great book, this powerful book called Daniel. We thank you, Lord, for where we have succeeded in our study. We pray for mercy for where we have fallen short. We ask that you would give us the blessing that you have promised, a blessing of assurance, confidence, and faith. And grant that we can be like Daniel in these severe times and that we can trust you. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, Amen.